And now, deep thoughts. Hey, you're listening to Deep Thoughts, a podcast exploring the Christian faith a little more deeply. I'm your host, Matt Schantz, and it would not be a stretch to assume that everyone listening to this episode has people in their lives who have left the church in recent years. Now, some have left the church because it was the inevitable culmination of their faith deconstruction. Others have simply left because they got out of the habit. Sometimes the reasons are sensationalized ones, having to do with race, politics, and church scandal. But the reasons and number of departures have all been a bit nebulous until now. My guest in this episode is Jim Davis, pastor at Orlando Grace Church in Orlando, Florida, and co-author of the book, The Great De-Churching, Who's Leaving, Why They Are Going, and What It Will Take to Bring Them Back. This book is fascinating, timely, and helpful. I think you're going to find this episode to be all of those things as well. So now, here's my deep conversation with Jim Davis. Hi, Jim. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Man, good to be here. Thanks for having me. So you pastor in Florida, correct? Orlando Grace Church. That's right. Orlando. Okay. Were you born and raised in Florida or you're Third like everybody else? You Florida. moved to Florida. No. 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 I my I had one set of grandparents that moved here in the twenties and one in the forties, which means that my family was here before there was a good reason to be here. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what was the like the alligator to person ratio at that point in time? I wonder, man. Oh, it had to be insane. Yeah. yeah. The mosquito to person ratio is what I would be more concerned about. <laughs> sick, sick. Okay. It was back I before was just, there was bug spray. I was just doing some stuff with like Act 17 and about Athens. And I read this, this, like, it was like three to one, like idols to people in, in the city of Athens at, you know, the first century, wow. that kind of thing. And uh, I like to think that that was probably the uh, alligator to person ratio in Florida as well. But um, there, you Floridians get a bad rap. You know that, right? Like you're the brunt of jokes in America these days, it seems like. What do you make of it? Yeah. So uh, preceding COVID, there was the Florida man thing, because my understanding is Florida actually yes. like publishes arrest records where most states don't. So yes, I have to it. imagine places like Mississippi and Alabama have crazier stuff than we do. But ours is public. Um, I've heard. But that. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course. Of course, you know, during COVID, you would have thought like, and I'm not trying to get political here, but my friends in more closed states would have thought we were all out licking whole like <laughs> subway poles and things like trying to get sick. <laughs> so um, what do you, what are, I mean, Canadians can get um, that be the brunt of jokes for Americans as well. What's, what's something you hear about Canadians? What is a Floridian? Okay, I'm going to tell you a Canada? story. I, <laughs> okay. I, we, I, I used to think of Canadians as generally the nicest people you'll meet. And yeah. in preaching lab at RTS, there was a guy from Canada and there was this, I got to be careful in the way they tell the story. Somebody <laughs> preached a sermon that was very long. He read it. It was like 55 minutes, no illustration, no application. Yeah. And this, and afterwards, you know, it was process time and the Canadian's hand went up and he said, that was the most boring thing I have ever heard in my life. And like so, suck the air out of the room. Yeah. And this guy who preached sermon said, well, he you don't understand. Said it. He actually and, said it. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> well, he said, in my context, it's a small church. People are used to it. It works there. And then this Canadian his hand went up again and he said i think i can tell you why you have a small church and we're like you can't say that that is not okay and so all the stereotypes that i had about canadians being nice people went out the window yeah, with that right. preaching lab right <laughs> right and uh yeah we're all monolithic right so like we're exactly the same yeah yeah now, that's funny i mean that is the like caricature is we we say sorry all the time and we're really nice and and for whatever reason, most people think that Minis we have a Minnesotan's accent, but like, no, anyways, whatever. Um, good times. What's I the love difference to between a Minnesota accent and a Canadian accent? Well, it's like, 
uh, fix you some, fix you some eggs, Margie, you know, it gets like, we just, I just don't talk, talk like that. I don't know. We're, we're very, uh, <laughs> like we're, we're West coast by, you know, Pacific Northwest. We have a lot of affinity for like, you know, Washington, Oregon kind of folks and similar. We're stuck in the gray clouds and rain all the time. And that's, or people assume like I'm in a cohort with some Americans for uh, a program I'm in. And uh, the assumption is just that it's like, it it's like minus, well, we do Celsius, but like very, very cold and snowy. And it's like, no, like it's actually pretty nice and sunny. Like we just barely get snow where I am. But anyways, the assumption is like, I, I got to work today with the sled dogs and uh, it's just not the case. <laughs> so uh, Jim, I just want to thank you so much for this book, The Great Dechurching. Just a really fascinating read super timely and it's super timely because you did a major research project um, for the content of this book. I just love, first of all, just to hear uh, how did this come about? What were you seeking to do? How did you wind up doing the most comprehensive kind of study on this phenomenon going on right now? Yeah, I can try to give you a short answer to that. So this is this was birthed out of cultural exegesis. So I grew up in Orlando, mm-hmm. moved around the world for 15 years, came back, and I'm looking at Orlando along with my co-pastor, my co-author who was executive pastor of the same church at that time. And we began to just look at Orlando and we saw and we we started to observe that a lot of people used to go to church and don't anymore. And then we saw a Barna study that made the claim that uh, Orlando had the same percentage of evangelicals as New York City and Seattle, which hit us interestingly because the culture of Orlando feels very different than New York City and Seattle. And we began to realize, oh, okay, that's probably true, but the majority of people who don't go to church here used to as opposed to New York City and Seattle, and they carry Uh with them biblical values. In some cases, they really seem to be Christians. And so we wanted more information to understand what we're processing, and it just wasn't there. And I have some anecdotal things that along the way that that uh, really emphasize there is no good research on it. Um, and so while this is the largest uh, you know, nationwide comprehensive study, you got to p- compare that to the fact that nothing existed before that. So mm-hmm. that may make you less in- impressed at the research, but it is good research. It's great research. But I remember I was doing a, uh, a 10 minute talk on de-churching at a, a global a ministries global fundraiser and um and there was a very well-known pastor who was who was giving the keynote after me and afterwards i had this line of people wanting to talk to me and this really res- like respected influential pastor i look over and i see him grabbing coffee by himself and i was thinking this this doesn't make sense until i started to hear the stories of the people talking to me and i realized in 10 minutes i'm talking about their kids and grandkids yep. and nephews right. and nieces. And I was, so these aren't just numbers, you know, these are people mm-hmm. with souls. And, uh, and so all of that together led us to connect with Ryan Burge, who is a social scientist. And we had a, a thesis all along and it was uh, that we are in the fastest, largest and fastest religious shift in the history of our country. And we asked him to do a nationwide quantitative, academically peer-reviewed study, which basically means it's respected by everybody um, to prove or disprove that thesis. And we proved it, that we are in the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of our country is 40 million adult Americans uh, who used to go to church on a monthly basis now go less than one time per year. So really the problem could be even larger than that because if someone only comes on Easter, they're still counted as a churched person. Um, So it likely is much larger than what we even communicated. We just want to be conservative in our research. But, uh, and then we did more successive studies to understand it in more granular detail, but that's ultimately how it came about. We had no idea it was going to be a book. We were going to do, it was going to be a part of our podcast with TGC. And, uh, and, but once, you know, word got out, we realized anyway, that it became the book. So you just said something fascinating about the largest religious shift. Can you just unpack that a little bit? Because that is fascinating. Yeah. So in the United States, the previous largest shift in the, in our country was the 25 years post Civil War. So that was that, that that was obviously with a lot of people returning to church, going to church for the first time, immigrating and going to church. And our shift over the last 25 years, in terms of uh, percentage is 25% greater than that, just going the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. And because obviously we're a larger country now in terms of numbers, it is larger. I mean, it, it's lar- 
it, we're talking about more people than the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and all of the Billy Graham's crusades combined, just going the opposite yeah. direction. So let's talk about the results of the study. You, you mentioned in the introduction of your book, you say that it not only confirmed your basic hunches, and you were thinking Orlando and thinking that through, and they're like, let's, you're thinking, let's do a study, and it confirms those hunches, um, but you write that they were even more shocking um, results than you expected. Um, size, pace, scope, like, what were you discovering as the data was coming in? So there was a lot that was that was really interesting. So for one, why people are dechurching, and and so the dechurch person is not monolithic. That's something we go to great lengths to communicate in the book. But mm -hmm. if your information diet is more to the left, you're going to hear, well, dechurching is happening because of hypocrisy in the church, because of misogyny, racism, all those things. If your if your information diet is more to the right, you're going to hear, well, people are dechurching because of secular progressivism, the sexual revolution that kind of thing. Um, and, and really, they're both right and they're both wrong. So while both of those things are happening, the lion's share of dechurching has nothing to do with either of those explanations. The number one reason for dechurching in the United States was I moved. So 30 million of the 40 million dechurched for very pedestrian, boring, casual reasons. That's what we call the casually dechurched. Mm -hmm. When only 10 million dechurched uh, as a result of an intentional, they did so with intentionality. We call those dechurched casualties. And while I don't, I don't want to minimize the real pain that happened to those 10 million, we want to bust the myth that everybody's leaving in that way. We also uh, learned that um, the, the de-churching is affecting the lower educated, lower income bracket the most, like it, disproportionately so. Um, and in fact, evangelicals, the more education an evangelical has, the more likely they are to continue in the church. As only only three percent of evangelicals with master's degrees in our study had dechurched. So education, higher secular education, is not the boogeyman that we've made it out to be. Um, so we've uh, those would be some of the the top things that stick out in terms of surprises. Actually, okay, the, the last surprise that really was a surprise is how many people are willing to come back. Uh, Fifty one percent of evangelicals who had dechurched were communicated they were willing to come back today. And so there is a a real prime opportunity. And, and, and again, this this opportunity would be different based on what part of the country you're in. But uh, there is an opportunity to engage people who already have a positive experience of the church and in many cases believe the gospel or at least think they do. Um, there's a great ministry opportunity because our and, and our goal isn't just to put, you know, butts and seats and money in coffers. Our, our goal is to affect the eternities of souls. And the reality is that statistically, the children of the de will be unchurched. So we have a, a major generational opportunity with all these evangelicals who are, who communicate themselves. They're willing to come back today. Like that's, that's a lot of myth busting like that you just did there, like in a major way, like, cause, cause that's the narrative. I, I, I like how you said, if you're more right leaning, you're hearing that it's the, the it's cause the culture's going to hell in a handbasket and it's taking everybody with it. Right. Or if you're more left leaning, it's because of like all the scandal and, and there, and those, that stuff's troubling, but that is the narrative that those are the reasons. And you're saying, well, three quarters of the reasons are, I like that language of pedestrian reasons. We moved, there was some sort of shake up in our family dynamic and we just, or whatever, or there was this big, uh, shutdown <laughs> maybe that took place. Although that's not really too worked into your, uh, study necessarily. Yeah, we, we had a long two of weeks of Florida. We had a long two weeks of no meeting, but, uh, our data is post COVID like it, it is post COVID. So there are some things we can okay. pull onto that. end. we're probably in the next couple of years going to do a, kind of a follow-up to see what, uh, what trends in the COVID season are speeding up or slowing down. Um, but yeah, we do, we do have data to that end. But yeah, it is, it is, it is very myth busting for sure. Um, just because it's, it's not like the, the educated thing, right? The more educated you get, there's just this idea that like, well, you're going to see that Christianity silliness. It's not for the intellectual and stuff. And you're actually saying, well, the opposite is what we're seeing here. And um, so that's so, well, this is interesting. So you can do some intersectional stuff here too. And you can, 
if if it's hitting the lower income, lower educated harder, and it's really the lower income that's being hit, there's just a high correlation with education and income. Um, well, so if you have some of these life changes, like becoming a single parent, however that happens, moving for jobs, well, who does that hit the hardest? That hits the lower income the hardest. Mm -hmm. They then have to work longer hours, work more unusual hours, and that puts them at higher likelihood of dechurching, not because poor people don't have it because they don't have enough education to believe in Christianity. That's not it. They don't have the safety net. And so America, America works well for those on the typical American path. So you, you go to high school, you go to college, then you get married, then you have kids and you stay married. Like that's the American path. You get off that path and America doesn't work for you in the same way. And sadly, um, the, the American church, it has become an American institution. Some of that you can help some of that you can't, but, mm. but the American church is experiencing the same pitfalls as the as America does when somebody gets off that particular path, which is sad because you look back to the earliest origins of Christianity and a lot of the reasons that that Christianity flourished is because of how well it worked for the different disenfranchised, vulnerable poor. Yes. Yeah. So there's a there's an opportunity for church renewal in that regard in terms of to get back to some of those roots of actually um profoundly serving and dignifying those who are often forgotten in society. That, that's Christianity's roots. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, talk to me about the five profiles that you, um, you ended up categorizing this, this research into. Yeah. So this is, I always want to preface this because some people have this idea that like we did some research and then put our finger in the air and came up with these five, five mm -hmm. profiles, but we had over 7,000 participants, over 600 data points, and we ran that through an algorithm. Like we ran it through something called machine learning that began to compare common answer choices. Um, and and it, it said, these are profiles. Now you are, you need to figure out why, like what you're looking at. And so Ryan Burge and Mike Graham and I spent a lot of time looking at that. So we we developed four profiles with um, with evangelicalism and then one for mainline and Roman Catholic dechurching, which looks shockingly similar. So in the in the evangelical categories, we developed the one we call cultural Christians. So this is there are about 15 million dechurched evangelicals in the United States. We have the cultural Christians makes up the largest group at about eight million. The rest of the groups are 2.5 million. The cultural Christian, imagine a a white male, middle aged. Um, who has a positive experience of the church, didn't de-church really intentionally, more casually. But this group, when rated in the terms of their orthodoxy scores, and when we use our orthodoxy score, scores, we're talking about Nicene Creed Christianity, just basic mm -hmm. Christianity. They scored so poorly that only 1% of this group believed that Jesus was the Son of God. So we're, we're talking wow. about gr a group of people that probably weren't ever believers to begin with. By name alone, somehow, yeah. Right. Right. They still have a positive experience of the church, but they're they, in all likelihood, we're not looking at a regenerate true believer. Gotcha. Uh, then we have the mainstream de-churched evangelical, 2.5 million people who look a lot like the cultural Christians in that they're largely white, a little more female than male. Um, and this group de-churched also casually, but this group, is, their orthodoxy scores were higher than the people who still go to church. <laughs> they're ninety-seven percent of this group believes that Jesus is the Son of God, and one hundred percent said they are willing to come back today. They de-churched more recently. These are more the people who maybe got out of the habit with COVID or right before COVID. Life got busy, but this is the super low-hanging fruit. We actually uh, gave our research very early on to a church in Missouri, in Columbia, Missouri, and they saw this category and they were like, well, if this low hanging fruit is out there, let's do something. So they developed digital and personal initiatives to identify and engage this group. And if I remember correctly, in I think in four months, they had 300 new worshipers in their congregation because they identified this group identified. who said, we're willing to come back today. And they just ask them to come back. And so, you know, wow. I've talked with people in other countries that kind of get irritated. They're like, well, what were you saying? Just invite them back. And we're not, that's not, we're not saying that about everybody. We're just saying that about this one group, but it's not hard to identify them. And I'm currently in my own personal ministry, batting a thousand at inviting them to church and them coming. Hmm. Um, 
So that's the mainstream de church evangelical. Then you have the ex evangelical. And we were hesitant to use a term that's already being used in the wider culture, but it, it fits so well. The ex evangelical in our in our study, we used to describe a person. It's a it's you know you think about the person who's this person. These people did de church casual. Uh, ca- their casualties. They de church intentionally. Um, but something like 97% of them would say that Jesus is the son of God. So while they've left the church, it doesn't seem like they've left the faith. And so they do have pain points. Largely, they would say they're done with what sociologists call white evangelicalism. Um, but they are willing to return to some other expression of Christianity. It could be home, home church, cell church, black Protestantism, uh, mainline churches that still hold to the gospel. Um, and so that's a, fascinating group there. And then you had the BIPOC, the black indigenous persons of color. Um, This group, interestingly enough, there's a little more mixed and casually and casualty, but we hid race from the machine learning. We did not let it Hmm. see ethnicity at any level. And it still came up with a category that's 100% non-white because as sociologists and social scientists say, race casts a long shadow in the data. And so this group actually looks a little more like the cultural Christian, just in the non-white space. Um, they uh, they de-church quite some time ago. This group is actually the highest educated, highest income earning group in our study. Um, and so imagine a wealthy male businessman in Atlanta who's maybe in his early 50s and hasn't been to church since he established his young professional career. And so what we what we want to do is just say, hey, there, there's different types of de-church people. And it's helpful in really three or four questions. You can identify who you're looking at. Some just need a nudge. Some need to be at your dinner table. And some are going to need to be in your life for quite some time and have a work of the Holy Spirit in their heart mm. uh, for them to ever come back. But but that's that's ministry, knowing who we're talking about. I mean, you talked about Acts 17 earlier. I mean, that's what that's what Paul was doing um, in understanding and engaging his context the way the way he was doing it there. So then we get to mainline and Roman Catholic dechurching. It largely looks the same um, between each other. The the main difference is that unsurprisingly, Roman Catholics are more uh, they're they were more influenced by church scandal. And mainline has been more influenced by moving like everybody else. Now, what mm-hmm. Roman Catholics and mainline, they would have dechurched earlier. This is this is what we were more seeing okay. in the 90s and 2000s, mm-hmm. which th- this is another surprise. They would be more on the this part's not a surprise. What I'm about to say is surprise. They would have been more on the secular left. And we have this idea yeah. that it's those on the secular left dechurching. But now the secular right is dechurching at twice the pace of the secular left really and, and and pretty much fully catching up in total number in terms of who de, who is dechurched which has which has all mm-hmm. kinds of implications in our society and politics but um the, at the highest briefest level those are the categories yeah that's super insightful so interesting and it, that makes sense like in canada the dechurched mainline protestants i mean it's like years ago those churches were emptying out but it but but what you said just there resonates as well that well the secular right is catching up in terms of a lot of the evangelical churches um so you talked about 30 out of the 40 million leaving for pedestrian reasons can we talk just for a little bit about the 10 million that's significant who who left for uh, more complicated reasons and i um was talking with uh, another pastor Recently, some, something Ray Ortland has been doing is saying, what what would it look oh. like for the church to look in at what we've done wrong in this moment of great de-churching? He wasn't using that language. Maybe he was, I don't know. Um, but th- this moment of de-churching. You just say he was. Yeah, let's say he was. He was quoting Jim Davis. Um, all his good <laughs> stuff. All his good stuff came from Jim Davis. But um, this moment and say there are people who are leaving because the church has done wrong. And we don't need to have a posture of look at the evil culture. That's why they're leaving. There is a, there is a place for us to look in at ourselves and repent of where we've done it wrong. There have been scandals like um, the Southern Baptist convention is going through much of a movement. that The Catholic church was going through. It's not all that different. There's some real scandal, real heartbreak. The celebrity pastors that we have propped up 
how many of them have fallen and that's disorienting and we've done some stuff poorly there. I just wonder if you can speak to some of the hurts people have had that come up in the research that are not majority reasons, but some of the reasons that people have been leaving the church. Yeah. I mean, like you said, we're talking about 10 million people. That's a lot of people. Um, so Ryan Burge has, I remember going back years, he's had this theory when all the Roman Catholic scandals came out, he said, listen, you're going to see this in the non-denominational and congregational setting even worse in years to come because the, mm. that is more isolated. There's more of a cell structure where, uh, where bad things can thrive uh, without the accountability that happens with churches with a hierarchical structure. And our church does not is not one of the churches with a hierarchical structure. But I remember he said that, and now a lot of that is coming out. It was yeah. easier to uh, hide what was going on. But absolutely, I mean, I think this is, this is a time where all churches need to take a long look in the mirror. I think as churches, even, even if we're not the ones who have committed those those scandals, those atrocities in some ways, we need to be willing to say that is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that that is not what God has for his church. And we need to, if people have de-churched for that reason, we need to be ready and willing to say, you should have left that church. You, right. you, you really should have. Um, that doesn't mean God's plan for you isn't the church, but but you made a good decision by leaving that that church. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, I mean, it, it, it breaks our hearts to see these kind of things. I think there's a bunch of crap in American evangelicalism that, uh, that makes some of this stuff. You talked about the celebrity pastor culture, the ways that we've, you know, lifted up people that, that if they fall and when they fall, they can affect so many people. It's just, it's sad that we've created a culture where, where so much stands on one person. And I'm not just, I mean, they, they'll stand before the Lord for what they've done, but um, gosh, it makes me really think, and of course our church and I'm nowhere on that level, but we have to constantly think, how do we build the institution, not the person? Yeah. And I, I actually, I remember Tim Keller late in his life and he got, I would argue a little more, uh, direct in the way he said things late in his life in a way that I really appreciated. But he would talk about how he gave when, when Redeemer got big, he was thinking, how can I give my pa give power over to the institution? Yes. And, and I just, I, that resonated so much with me and he contrasted it with somebody else who, who didn't give power to the institution, but wanted to keep more of it for himself. And that person fell and it had a big impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well said. Um, so your private jet isn't very big is what you're saying, Jim. It's a smaller one. Man, man, I can't even get first class on a commercial jet. Yeah, totally I, right. I, I I've only ever flown economy in my last, life. It's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not only economy, I'm like the last boarding group. I'm boarding group <laughs> totally, G. Totally. I hope I get on this flight and they don't punt me. Yeah, That's exactly. Right. Yeah. I just hope my bag is allowed to be go going with me because I'm so late to board. 50 bucks more for my bag? Forget it. I'll just carry on. Yeah, no way. That's, uh, that's right. That's, that's the... That's the typical pastor life right there. That's great. That's probably a good thing. Um, you know what? Uh, this is an exclusively American study, correct? It is. What do you, why do you guys hate Canada so much? <laughs> we don't hate Canada and we, you know, there, there are. It's, it's that guy from seminary, of, isn't it? It's because of the guy from seminary. That's because it's because of him. <laughs> He's yeah. actually a good guy. I like him. I just, he just ruined my perception of perception yeah, of yeah. Canadians. He yeah. sounds great. But, he sounds great. Uh, I, I really like him. He's a good dude, good pastor, but um, direct communicator. <laughs> but yeah, I, we there's so many studies that we would like to do. So one reason that uh, that books like this don't get written is because we had to raise a hundred thousand dollars just to do the research before we even knew what we'd be looking at. So you're never net net actually going to make money on a book like this. Now we had some generous donors who made that research mm. possible, but we 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 a had to limit our research somewhere. I mean, it would have it would have been so much more money to to yeah. research something like that. But also there are a number. of of projects that if someone wants to write a hundred thousand dollar check, there are a number of things that we that would be fun to look into and to research, and that can happen. All right, deep thoughts, listeners. There you go. There that that's put out. Um, he'll still fly economy, but could really put that to good use. So 
I have a couple interesting, <laughs> couple interesting Canadian data points. Um, I was mentioning offline before we got started here. I, I utilized uh, some of the content from this book in um, my talk at our annual general meeting here at our church, and just trying to paint a picture of yes, there's a great de-churching going on. We experience it. We feel it. Our church is is growing in the midst of this decline. Um, and yet, um, we're so every one of our lives have been touched by those who are in these descriptions you just gave, these profiles, and people in our lives that we love. And so we care about this stuff. Our heart is to to reach this valley that we live in. And some of those are people who have left the church. We'll get to some reasons for hope and optimism here at the end, but a couple couple interesting data points here in Canada specifically that I worked into my uh, my talk there is that it's estimated, this is a study done in Canada, estimated that more than 9,000 church buildings across Canada will close permanently by 2029. Um, that that data is from 2019. Just for context in Canada, that's a third of church buildings across the nation expected to close wow. by 2029. And so um, it's interesting, right? When you have expensive... When it's expensive for housing and things like that, a church goes up for sale that's fledgling. They take the top dollar. They don't pass it on oftentimes to another church. Now, that said, we've had two churches in our area gift us their church buildings. We've planted campuses and the Lord has been kind and stuff like that's happening. But by and large, churches are dwindling in Canada. They can't make it financially. And the denomination or overseeing body put the building up for sale and they're disappearing from the landscape. Um, Not only that, here's an interesting one about uh, COVID, the pandemic. Before the pandemic, it said 30% of Canadians said they never attend a religious service. Post-pandemic, now 67% of Canadians say they never attend a religious service. I forget what the exact, if that was within the year kind of thing, but that's from 30% saying never to now 67% of Canadians saying they never attend a religious service. So that shift is massive in Canada uh, that's happening um, right now. Um, I'd love to well, hear- I, I would- Real quick, I mean, in, in the United States, even there was a Barna study, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get the numbers off slightly, but like in 2014, there were, it was something like uh, 300. We were net gaining 300 churches a year in America, and then by 2018, we were net losing like 800 churches a year. So I mean, the trend is just, mm. it's insane. So same thing, we're seeing the same yep. thing here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just for my listeners and for you, the arborists are here today. So there is like this <laughs> rumble of, uh, of chainsaws. Oh, good. Good. I hope the listeners don't hear it as well. Um, but I'm sure hearing it. Um, so you had this, you already said it in, in this conversation, but you had this great line, but a sobering line in the book that this generation's de-churched will be the next generation's unchurched. And so despite the concerning trends, like the the biggest religious shift in in American history happening now, but in the opposite direction of the positives from before, like those are sobering statements. And yet um, the book's quite hopeful. Uh, You're really intentional. The last third of the book, you're writing it that way. So in parsing through the research, um, what started to give you hope? What did you latch on to and said, hey, there's reason for optimism here? Um, Reason that you saw and maybe reason that our listeners would have, should have. So, yeah. So at one level, so I'll I'll get to larger hope in a second, but so my... It, I've not actually, this is the first time I've thought to describe it this way, but when uh, my wife was 29, she had a lot of health issues. We couldn't figure it out. And finally she got diagnosed with cancer and she's doing fine. She's great now, but there was something about the diagnosis that was healing. Like, okay, now we know what's going on. And now we, we can, we can address mm. the problem at hand. And so at, at some level, understanding some of the things that some of the reasons for de-churching and what we can do to 
to target people at highest risk of dechurching is helpful to understand what we're doing that's contributing to dechurching. Um, the the age range that you're most likely to dechurch is 13 to 30, which can sound like a wide range, but there are three life stages that are very very important. You have high school, college, and establishing your young professional career. And we're realizing that in most churches, those stages are not being resourced and discipled the way that the way that they need to be. So for us, there was a there was a and even just like the blessing of congregational worship, um, being able to teach that more and disciple something that we maybe have just assumed or been weak on for so long, or maybe just been weak on and embracing an alternative in online worship, which is, we can have that discussion if you want, but uh, I would argue that the way that Paul and Luke and others use the word worship, online worship is an oxymoron, although right. I'm thankful for technology. I'm thankful for technology as a way to move people toward embodied worship, but not as a replacement. Yep. But at a highest level, I really believe like what we're seeing, like it doesn't surprise me that your church is growing. I, a lot of the churches that are growing now are the ones who are holding on to the historic gospel, who are doing mm -hmm. so in a winsome way, mm -hmm. who have account appropriate accountability in the church. We use the term membership. Uh, you can use other terms, mm -hmm. but we, medium walls is a phrase we've been using post writing the book. There's there's not high cultish walls, but it's not total anonymity. You know, attracting people with entertainment is true discipleship where you are known. So I believe there is there is a kind of purification going on here, and I know a lot of churches that are doing really well now because I feel like they're they're doing the best they can by God's grace under the power of the Holy Spirit to do what we're called to do as a church. I also honestly recognize that the church is booming in the rest of the world. Like just because it's not mm. great in America at the moment does not yes. mean all is lost in the kingdom. Like the church could go away in the United States and still be larger today than yep. it has really ever been in the history of the church. I think yep. I heard somebody, there, there's a statistic that there are more Christians alive today than all all of the Christians who have ever lived the first yes. 1900 years of Christianity. I've heard that. So, I mean, like the church is doing fine. You know, Jesus's kingdom is going to reign eternally. It's on the um, rise. So there's a, it's on the rise globally. It's just a fact. It is on the rise. Yep. Yeah, it is. So I, I, I don't, I, I'm not disheartened in the least. Now hmm. I do recognize uh, or, or, sorry, at a high level. <laughs> now I do recognize that like uh, the people in our church, they're, their kids and grandkids are growing up in our context in, in a harder spiritual environment than than we grew up. Now, may, yeah. maybe it's, you know, I would assume you're a little bit ahead of what we're experiencing here. But I also lived in Europe. I, I lived in Italy for five years where um, that is not a church environment. That's I can draw out yeah. what I mean by that, but it's not. Post-Christian. A lot of the a lot. It's, it's a post-Christian environment. I mean, less than 2% of the population goes to any kind of church, Catholic or Protestant on a regular basis. Wow. But man, I'll go and visit this church that we helped plant. And it's like 60 people worshiping. And it's so sweet. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's like, it's evangelism, it's discipleship. I mean, you know, church planting, I'm, I'm going all over the place now, I know, but like church planting in the 90s and 2000s, praise God, it just, it, it wasn't terribly hard. In, in the historical context, like like in, in our context, most church planters were doing something new, whether it was expository preaching, uh, contemporary music, relevant messages with air quotes, you know, like whatever it was, it was, there was new. And so they were seeing Christian transfer growth uh, right. and they're having Christians come over who had, were already discipled to give and support. And so it gave us this idea that church plants should be over 200 people and self-sufficient within two years. But now what's happening is ministry and church planting is returning to the hard work that it's always been, but the sweet work of evangelism and discipleship. And man, if that's what if that's what God does in this, returning us to evangelism and discipleship, getting us away from this massive American consumeristic model, then I, I praise him for that. Yeah. I think there's, there's lots of hope for what we see. I think there's actually lots of hope for the, you know, for what we see gospel centered churches doing today. Um, and, and I think there's that, you know, we can raise a generation inside the church who's ready to, you know, who, who also has a foot in a very dark world and can be yeah. arguably even more fruitful than we have been. Yeah. There, there are some, there are some really positive 
things that I see can come from the church being refined, right? Um, there, if you one one of the fascinating biblical themes is what God has done throughout history with a remnant, like just mm. with a small group of that. Like, there's no cultural Christians in the group, right? There's no cultural believers. Um, I did a little bit of church planting in Vancouver. Two percent of the city went to church on a regular basis, and some of the churches in the city were pretty weird, pretty wild. So if two percent go, and some of them are like not on the orthodoxy spectrum. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like this city, like, but so when you're in this church plant though, nobody's going because they're a cultural Christian. These are the only Christians they know. They're committed to Jesus. They're committed to discipleship. They want to see people around them come to Christ who do not know him. It's evangelistic. And there was just how galvanizing that was around, um, just in the faith and in what, what Christian church community was meant to be because you needed it. It wasn't just around and you could just get it in all these places. You needed each other. The most vibrant, yeah. you know, small group my wife and I have ever been a part of was the one we hosted that year in our living room, multi-generational, multi-ethnic, different stages of life, first generation Christians. And it was just the sweetest community in the world to us. And um, so even if things get hard, even if there's some sort of shrinking that potentially goes on in the church, we can see that as um, the Lord using it as a season to build a remnant that, that I, I worry that sometimes I'm going all over the place now too. I worry sometimes that because there are so many cultural Christians, they latch onto the title of I'm a Christian and they do some things that are wildly unchristian and it does not help the cause of the gospel. And yet if that stuff's getting weaned in this season, if we're weaning from people who are saying I'm a Christian, that's somehow advantageous to me. Like those days are gone in Canada. It's, there's no reason to say I'm a Christian. If you're not, it does not win you anything positive, helpful, um, cachet. And so if that's leaving, um, and the remnant become deeper discipleships and that community is enriched. There are huge opportunities that lie ahead of us. So, so that's an interesting aspect of it all too. Um, and yet I want to just touch on that one piece you said too, that I find wildly, um, hopeful as well, which is the 51% of a certain category of folks, uh, you, you talked about said they'd come back. 51% of evangelicals, evangelicals, church evangelicals. If what they were invited by someone they know, that kind of a thing. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, 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 fifty-one percent of all dechurched evangelicals would say that they're willing to come back today. Um, when you talk about mm. the mainstream dechurched evangelical, with that, that dechurch recently has no pain point, great orthodoxy score, clearly a Christian. In my own ministry, I Mike Graham and I do this different ways, but like I have about four questions I'll ask. Um, you know, it, it, we're in, in the appropriate relational context, but basically, uh, did you grow up going to church? And if they say yes, I mean, I'll, do you go to church now? No. Now I know they're de-churched. Um, well, what, what caused you to not go to church? Then I can figure out if they're casual or your casualty. I'll ask something like, who is Jesus to you? I'll figure out their orthodoxy score. And I can, I can usually in those four questions understand, oh, all, you're, you seem to be a Christian. And if you are, you have the Holy Spirit in you. So that's a big deal. And, and so I will invite them to go to church and generally, I mean, always they've, in my experience, they've come, but, um, but I also in those conversations would talk about the importance of like why God gave us the church and embodied worship mm -hmm. and, uh, how, how we're not meant to be lone ranger Christians, there's no concept of privatized spirituality before the enlightenment. And so uh, those are some of the things in the conversations, but it, it, with Christians, that tends to go well. I mean, it really, it really does. Now, sometimes I'll realize in the conversation that I'm a Christian and I'm sorry, right, well, you need the gospel and let's, let's talk about the gospel. Hmm. It's, but it's it, almost, is, it is hopeful. It is hopeful. And it's it, just for, for, for followers of Jesus who are listening there it's, it's a, it's a unique evangelistic opportunity, which is actually, we have a lot of this stuff in common by asking those four questions. You're like, Hey, we're on this lot, same page in a lot of this. And if you invite two of them to church, one of them's coming with you. That's what it means. You know, like, uh, and so it's an evangelistic opportunity in term. And this is what the apostle Paul did. Like when he went into a new city, he'd go to the synagogue, those who were familiar with the Bible, but he'd also go into the marketplace. Those who were not 
not familiar with the Bible. Like in Acts 17, he does not quote scripture once to these people because they had no, they didn't have a framework for it. But he event, but he talked about, you know, how in their, in language, they could understand how they could be brought to God. But when he went to the synagogue, he's like, Hey, let me make the gospel connection. Let me make the Jesus is the Messiah connection for you. Cause that's the piece you need. And I just think for followers of Jesus, we're like, man, I don't know if I, I'm not, I'm really an evangelist. It's like, Hey, if they used to go to church and don't right now, there is just like a loving kind conversation you can have, ask a couple questions, live well, uh, listen well, care well. There's a huge opportunity for you there. Um, I guess a final question to you, Jim, maybe it's for pastors. I, I just be helped by getting the answer, but for all of us who value church, what is it we can do in the discipleship in the church that says, um, Hey, we can screw up at church. We we've done some of this poorly. Um, we, people have been hurt by church and that kind of thing, but, but how do we maybe show folks that like church is essence, church is core. What is it in our discipleship that maybe we can be a little more robust at in this moment of like, ah, church, I, I, Hey, my orthodoxy scores are high, but I, I just don't go to church anymore. It's like, well, ultimately that shouldn't jive at some point is like, you don't take Jesus and go, ah, his bride's pretty annoying. Yeah. I don't want her, you know, it, it it matters. And so what would be a word for us in terms of robust discipleship, in terms of uh, ecclesiology, a theology of the church? It's a great question. I'm going to start at the very beginning. And when you talk about, you were talking about evangelism a second ago, Tim Keller said, actually in the context of contextualization, but I would apply it in evangelism. It's, he said, it's knowing mm-hmm. the storylines of, of the people in your life and showing them how it finds its best ending in Jesus. And yeah. so that, I love that illustration. They're, they're seeking things like how, how does what they want find its best ending in Jesus? Mm-hmm. Um, or, it, or at least, you know, confronting their core idols and things like that. But then you get into, uh, they would start talk, talking about believers. I think in the 20th century, we focused a lot on what is true. You see this in our apologetic methods, in our uh, tracks, in our sermons, what is true about the Bible, true about the gospel, um, and the gospel in the Bible is true. What's true about historic Christianity, it's all true, but it, it came at the expense of what's good and beautiful, and there's a little mm-hmm. bit of lacking of like, like Jesus has a vision for human humanity flourishing, that we flourish yes. best in him. And in him, we are together. Like we are a part of the body of the Christ, a body of Christ. We're not, we don't flourish in him alone. We flourish as totus Christus. You know, we are all a part of the body and we're designed to flourish in him somehow mysteriously together as a body. As a body. And so that happens through holistic discipleship, uh, discipleship of the head, discipleship of the heart, discipleship of our hands, how we should act. Um, you know, I, I gave the example, I think in the book, I did in the book, when we lived overseas, every now and then I would get to go uh, onto a U.S. Army base, you know, get Thanksgiving or something. And a group of us would go and it was it was this interesting experience because we were thousands of miles from home. And then we walk onto this base and it's like, it feels like we're home. You have to see Taco Bell and Pizza Hut and use dollars <laughs> and the sirens, sirens make the right sounds, uh, free refills, ice, like all things we're used to. Somehow we know we're thousands of miles from home, but we feel like we're home. Like that's what the church Mm -hmm. is designed to do. That's what corporate worship is designed to do. And so there's your question right there could be a whole season of podcasts, but that's, those are my very short um, answers to that. Oh, that's so great. I, I'm glad I found a kindred spirit in you uh, mentioning Keller a couple times. I, I love what he said about um, about preaching when it preaches if there's non-believers in the room and if there if there aren't, which there always are, but if there aren't, there will be because Christians will be like, oh, I can bring my unbelieving friends to hear this. and um, and so eventually they will be in the room and 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 the way he he, he encourages preachers to preach, is that somebody who's not a believer would hear the sermon and go, I wish that that were true. And I think that's, you know, and now it's just a connection of, well, it is true. And the true follows. We believe it's truth, like you said. 
but he's he's emphasizing it's beautiful it's good it's actually what your heart desires most and you resonate yeah. with it and then you go and by the way it's also true um and so that that's a good word uh for us there about about what's good and beautiful and uh showing that vision uh jim i, I want to thank you for the book it's been super helpful to me uh, it's a, now a resource for our congregation as well and uh, appreciate you carving out a little bit of time for canadian that you didn't include in the research, but at least you included in this conversation. Thanks, man. Man, I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Well, who knew that a study and book about the largest shift away from church in American history could be so encouraging? But it is. Jim and his co-author Michael have helped us immensely by quantifying the dechurching phenomenon, identifying profiles of who is leaving, how we might engage them well, and offering some important lessons for the church in the process. I hope this episode, like the book, helps you navigate this significant moment in a meaningful and relationally compelling way. And just a word about Jim, uh, he was one of the kindest and easiest to talk to, enjoyable interviews I've ever done on the podcast, and I am 91 episodes in. So thanks, Jim. Turns out Florida's got some decency in it, which I, I knew all along. But hey, uh, another Q&A episode is coming. It's in the works. And I just want to encourage you, go to the Deep Thoughts Instagram page and submit a question. I would love to answer it. Thanks for listening to Deep Thoughts. I hope it helps you in fostering deep faith.